At CrowdStrike, we spent a lot of time thinking about the bad guys. What they're up to, where they're located, who they are. Criminal actors engage in theft, extortion, wire fraud. These crimes aren't new. The way that they conduct their attacks, the technology they're using may be new, but the attacks are not new. Radical activists, nationalists, terrorists, hacktivists engage in disruptive attacks meant to bring visibility to a particular cause or idea. They use website defacements, distributed denial of service attacks in order to accomplish their mission. Nation states engage in sabotage, operational preparation of the environment, making sure that if a future conflict is to arise, that they have created a favorable landscape for themselves. They conduct destructive attacks, things meant to dis degrade capabilities of their adversaries, and yes, even espionage. Espionage, they say, is the second oldest profession in the world, and if you look back through history and through time, you can find all kinds of examples and stories about espionage, even as far back as the Bible. In fact, if you look at the book of Joshua, there's a story about Rahab, a supposed prostitute, who shielded two Israelite spies that were sent to the city of Jericho to reconnoiter the military capabilities, defensive capabilities, and the lay of the land. The goal was that if they reconnoitered the city, they would be in a better position to attack. They would know how to effectively dominate, win that conflict. CrowdStrike tracks many threat actors across the globe. These threat actors have different capabilities, different tools that they bring to the party. We track them using a system, a cryptonym system. China tracked under Panda. Russia under Bear. Criminal actors we track under Spider and hacktivist actors track under Jackal. When we think about these actors and what they can do, we also think about what they want to do, their intentions. By mapping these, we can start to approximate what is the greatest threat, which ones do we need to prioritize. This mapping is meant to represent the West. You can see that China, North Korea, Russia dominate the upper quadrant of that map. These are the most common threats that we encounter. They have the most intent to do something and the highest capabilities. Iran, interestingly, was much lower in terms of intentions several years ago. As the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, the nuclear plan was done away with, the tanker wars of 2019 and the targeted killing of Qassam Soleimani in January of 2020, the Iranians became more intent on targeting the West. And so they've moved up on that chart. Their capabilities haven't changed, only their intentions. These threat actors have recently taken on a new capability, using SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19 themology in their attacks. Almost every single one of them is doing it. And it's because of the concern that their targets have for coronavirus. By now we know where coronavirus came from and we understand that we're in the grips of a pandemic. The way of life that we experienced up until January of this year has changed dramatically. If we think about how we got here, it's an interesting timeline. In December, the first cases of pneumonia were identified in Wuhan. Shortly thereafter, the pathogen behind the sickness was identified, SARS-CoV-2. From there, the disease spread from country to country, and the first fatalities emerged. In a very short order from when it started spreading, cyber threat actors began using it in their attacks. Mummy Spider, the actor behind Emotet, was using it by late January of 2020 as people were worrying or concerning themselves about whether or not this disease might impact the Olympics meant to be in Tokyo in 2020, that actor began creating lures that contained coronavirus themology in them in Japanese and 
targeting the people of Japan. Within about a week of this, we started seeing China, North Korea, other threat actors jumping on board, realizing that people were fearful about what was going on, that they had this unquenchable thirst for information about the virus and the pandemic and where things were going, and their concerns grew into financial and, and other places from there. These threat actors were able to quickly take advantage of this. In fact, the number of files that CrowdStrike began seeing by March was up a hundredfold. This is unprecedented. This continued on pace throughout the spring, and we continue to see COVID-19 themed files today. So I think this shows the cap capabilities that the adversaries brought to the table when some faced with a pandemic. If we go back a little bit before that, though, we can start to tell a more interesting story. I think it's more interesting. And in order to do that, let's talk about the cases, the, the number of cases first. I think it kind of sets a tone for where I'm going. By now, China's had over 85,000 cases. Italy, which was at the height of the media cycles in March because of the community spread, has over 300,000 cases. The United States has over 7 million cases, over 200,000 confirmed dead. Vietnam has less than 1,000. A country with a population of near 96 million shares a border with China, has less than 1,000 cases. How can that be? The answer is a cyber threat actor that we track as Ocean Buffalo. Ocean Buffalo has been around since 2012. They conduct espionage operations across the globe. They target dissidents, media, a variety of business verticals, all to steal information to enable the decision-making process of the government of Vietnam. Their capabilities and their ability to take this information really made a difference in the response to coronavirus. In early January, as we were st first starting to learn about this new novel disease, Vietnamese cyber operators were tasked with targeting China. They targeted governments, agencies in Wuhan. They targeted the Ministry of Emergency Medicine, healthcare providers, insurance aid providers across China, all to get information that would enable them to make more effective decisions. This information enabled them clearly to implement what we would consider draconian measures, or we did at the time, in mid-January, instituting travel bans, quarantine, vigorous contract tracing. They understood that this disease was spreading in a way that nobody else did at the time. They understood what the severity of this disease was and the impact it might have on the people of Vietnam, and they took an effective measure against it with that information. What this shows is that cyber operations can make an incredible difference for an adversary. It can enable them to make better decisions when it relates to a disease or some sort of other emergency. It can enable them to make more effective decisions in the marketplace by stealing technology and information that they can use to benefit their own capabilities in their own industries. And so, this week at Falcon, we'll be talking a lot about technology, strategy, adversaries, and things that you can do to ensure that they aren't effective in stealing your secrets, your operational information, things that you care about. I look forward to working with all of you in the future, and I invite you to come see these presentations and engage with us as we work together to fight these adversaries.